Hello, pup parents, and welcome to today's episode of the Perfect Pup Podcast. My name is Devin. I'm very excited for today's episode for two reasons. Number one, we are covering a topic that is very frequently asked and can be a very, very difficult um, topic slash behavior, and that is resource guarding. So I'm very excited to dive into that. And the second reason I'm excited is we have a returning guest. We have Jocelyn on with us. Thank you again, Jocelyn, for coming back on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So before we kind of dive in, I do want to give um, a little bit of an overview of who you are so people know who they're talking to in a sense, right? Um, So Jocelyn has been training and consulting with dogs for over 10 years. Um, She has her CTC and CPDT certifications, um, and she spent the majority of her career working with the rehab of rescue dogs, many who came from very dire and just difficult situations. Um, And since 2018, she's been running her own dog training company called Mutineer and is, and she's based out of sunny Los Angeles. We were just discussing how that has been very beneficial. So anything I missed on that intro or any other fun facts, I know you, uh, you got a new pet during COVID, right? Oh yeah. Uh, we welcomed Twyla, who's a little tuxedo kitten into our crew. Um, I'm sure she's going to like dive bomb this intro at, or at this interview at any moment. So we'll, we'll she welcome her when she camp. can. Yeah. Like something like that. that uh, yeah. That's probably to be expected, right? Yeah. But she's been such a joy. It's so, um, it's really fun because I'm kind of new to cats um, to get to kind of learn a whole new set of like, you know, body language and, um, animal behaviors and things like that. And just see how very, very different they function than dogs and how there's some overlap, like, um, fun fact that I just learned the other day while I was removing some wallpaper in our new home. Um, she like came up next to me and like was very intently watching me. And then she like pawed up on the wall and started kind of trying to peel the wallpaper as well. And I was like, is this where the copycat thing comes from? And they Googled it and they do mimic, which is something dogs can't do. And it was really fun to see um, that like mimicry in action. Really fun. That is hilarious. I'm sure that was just like a very outstanding moment in your mind. Like, wow, this is actually, she's just trying to do what I'm doing. That is hilarious. Yeah. So intelligent. I love it. Um, And, you know, maybe she'll kind of come up too, because again, with this topic of resource guarding, oftentimes that does happen between multiple animals, dogs to dogs, dogs to cats. So let's, let's dive right into it and, and really get into this topic, because like I said, you know, and you know, this, it's a tough topic. It is something that can be very scary. It can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, And so I will say that from the get go here, that if you're experiencing real troubles with resource guarding, get a professional trainer involved. And we'll, we'll discuss that more in depth, but this is a topic that can be, it, it is serious in the sense that, you know, it can lead to bites and it can lead to very deep problems. So we kind of want to make that disclaimer first, but um, with that being said, you know, why do dogs resource guard? What is going on in their mind? What are they trying to tell us? And yeah, what is resource guarding? Yeah, so resource guarding um, is, you know, a pretty like normal kind of like, you know, biological behavior that we see in our pets. It's unfortunately not something that got lost along for the ride with the domestication process. So, you know, we still see this in, you can see it in puppies if it's, you know, a genetic behavior. Um, Sometimes it's a learned behavior. Um, So you can see it in, you know, the purebred dog that you are welcoming in your, to your home, or you might see it with your rescue dog. That's a little bit older. Um, so there's no kind of like, um, breed or age that's excluded from being able to, you know, not see this type of behavior. But that being said, you know, it's, and we see it with like any type of resource. So it might be that a dog is coveting their toys or their balls. Um, other dogs, you're going to see it only with food items. And then some dogs, you're going to also see it. And you can think about their body as a resource. There's, it's really a limited resource. There's only one of them. Um, so it's the same thing when we're seeing a dog that has like paw handling sensitivity or even petting sensitivity. Um, 
most of the time it's a fear-based behavior where you're um, seeing kind of like a big outburst um, when they're feeling threatened that their that their um, important resource might be taken away from them. That's great info, and and I do think it's important to like have a little bit of empathy for our dogs in the sense of you know even when you were a kid and you had a toy and you went you know, you're in preschool or whatever, and some random kid comes up and snatches the toy out of your hand, like you're frustrated, you want it back, maybe you hit that kid, like, it, it's kind of a natural reaction. So I think it's important, yeah, to have that kind of level of empathy for our dogs. So with it being a fear based behavior, if my dog starts to resource guard, whether it's around me or around other dogs, what should I not do? Yeah, so we never want to go like head to head with a dog or like create more competition over that item that can really, really quickly kind of escalate things. So if I see that a dog is resource guarding an item from me and they start to show some warning behaviors, like they might freeze over it, um, they might, you know, kind of hunker down, they might increase the consumption of the item um, as I approach lift the lip, those kind of warning signals are um, indicators that I should stop what I'm doing because I don't want the dog to feel like they need to escalate those warnings. At the end of that escalation is a bite delivery. So I don't want to be on the receiving end of that, nor do I, you know, if I get a bite delivered, I am almost guaranteed to pull away which is negative reinforcement, right? The, the scary thing, my reach is being removed because of that bite. I don't want to reinforce, you know, push so far that the dog feels like they need to bite. They deliver that bite and then that bite is reinforced, right? Because you're going to get increased biting. Um, so instead, I want to use that negative reinforcement, pull away, pull back when I see that growling or when I see that freezing. Or I want to say, oh, good job. Thank you for communicating with me that you're feeling uncomfortable, let's revisit this in a way where you're comfortable so that I can kind of, you know, make sure you feel okay and safe around your resources. And we'll address it then kind of more systematically. But again, we never want to kind of add more tension um, or competition over that item. Um, you'll see increased biting, you'll see, um, you know, faster kind of going to the warning, even if you can kind of punish it out in that moment, you're not addressing the like underlying, like I covet this thing and I'm afraid to lose it. Mm -hmm. very, very interesting. And I, I don't usually do this, but I kind of feel that it's important. It's something I'm thinking about. There is a video that has circulated on social media a lot with a, I don't know if I'll even call him a trainer where I'll say his name is Caesar Milan. And it's, it's a video of a Labrador, right? And he, the, the Labrador is resource guarding food. And he takes the exact approach that you just said not to do. And he ends up getting bit. And if you go read through comments on it, and there's tons of reaction videos on YouTube, right? And, and all, you know, trainers are saying exactly what you're saying of like, that is the exact opposite of what you want to do. And again, I don't mean to like bash or anything. I just do think it's important to remember that just because you see something on TV, that doesn't mean it's the correct way to do it. So thank you for clarifying that. So on that point of, you know, you were saying, give them some space and kind of, you know, at least give them the, the understanding of, okay, I'm not going to come take that away, but then how do you handle it? Because, and again, we're not going to dive too deep into this. We, we discussed this a little bit before we started recording for, you know, those of you listening, we, we, we don't want to go too deep on it because it is a very complex topic and it is something that often requires professional help. Um, but what are some things that you can do if you see this resource guarding starting to happen? Yeah. Well, and like, thanks so much for bringing up that video. As soon as you started saying, I've seen a video, I was like, is it that Caesar's worst bite video? Cause that is like horrific. Um, and yes, yeah, like exactly the wrong approach. Um, if I could like illustrate like what not to do. It's like that, you know, like putting more pressure, like hunkering down, like me showing or like mirroring the um, like aggressive, like body posturing and that kind of thing. Like that's just going to create more tension. Um, you know, if you think about like two humans who are kind of like having some tension between them, if you 
feed into that, it's going to escalate versus if one person starts to diffuse or take a pause or step away, then you can kind of collect yourselves and like come back to a conversation that's a little bit more level-headed. And, you know, of course that's like an anthropomorphized um, translation of what's happening, but it's still energy, right? Like aggression will typically get more aggression um, versus we want to kind of diffuse the situation when the dog's uncomfortable. And I also think it's important to kind of point out too here that like, this isn't like a leadership problem. This is a problem where the dog is feeling threatened and the dog is feeling unsafe, right? So that's where we're seeing the root cause of this like display behavior. So what we do want to do is create an environment where the dog feels safe about their resources. So that might look like flooding the economy with more resources so that the dog doesn't feel like I only have this one toy and like I really got to hang on to it. If there's 50 toys, that's like too many to guard. Or they might just be like, oh, that it's no big deal because I have so many toys now. So, you know, this one's not so valuable. Sometimes that backfires and then you have a dog who's like going from toy to toy to toy and he's kind of neurotic. So, um, you know, I think again, like you were saying, it's important to like have a supervision of um, a qualified force-free trainer kind of overseeing your plan because there are a few different strategies and not one strategy fits all for this type of aggression behavior. Um, and then, you know, of course, in the moment, we want to make sure that we're immediately backing off. You can even do some quick trades. Like if, if you're in a jam and you need to get that thing away, like your dog has um, grabbed a piece of contraband and you know it's kind of an important thing that you need to get back or it's dangerous for the dog to have, you're gonna wanna just present a trade for like a high value piece of food and you know show them, hey, look, I have some chicken. Get their attention with that treat and toss it in the other direction, hoping that they'll drop that contraband, go for that, that chicken that you tossed a few feet away so that you can collect the item in a way that's, you know, calm and kind of systematic versus trying to reach for that item that's already in their mouth. We don't, you know, want to proceed or, you know, chase or give in to like any kind of um, pressure making responses. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And and so on just like a quick question on that trade, and just to maybe clarify for myself and listeners, if there is something like you said, you're in a bind and you're like, okay, they cannot have that in their mouth, finding something as high value as possible and getting their attention and, and showing that treat away and hoping that they will go off to that. Is that correct? Yeah, because they can't like eat the chicken. And also you're like, you know, your, your shoe at the same time. Like they're going to have to drop the shoe to retrieve the chicken. Okay. That makes sense. I like that. So one, one other question, I know that this is where it can get a little bit more complex. So again, we won't go like too in depth on it, but we're, we've been talking about kind of more of like dog to human resource guarding. What about when it's other dogs? Cause I see this happen a lot at, you know, parks or whatever, where a dog's playing fetch um, and, and another dog comes up to where their ball is. And there's that, again, you see those warning signs. So how do you typically approach that when it's between two dogs and resources? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, um, I see this almost more frequently with my clients than, um, I do, you know, dog to human resource guarding is resource guarding among the other pets in the house. And, um, you know, as I was mentioning earlier, I just got a kitten and my, my dog and my cat are like playing beautifully, but every now and then Edgar, my dog will start resource guarding one of her little toys. He thinks they're really great. And sometimes he doesn't want to share. Um, and so the short answer is management. Mm -hmm. We always want to provide management for our pets because resource guarding is so normal and almost like an ingrained part of like animal to animal communication. Um, 
that we just want to be good pet guardians and like protect them from feeling the need to um, guard their items. Also, because we want to make sure that our pets within the household are getting along, right? So I want to provide an environment to really set them up for success. And this goes to for, um, you know, the, the ball hoarding dog at the dog park, I want to use management as the owner. And maybe the dog park is not the most appropriate place for my dog to be if I have a dog that is resource guarding tennis balls and, you know, going after other dogs at the dog park, that's not going to be very fun for the other dogs that are kind of getting like barked or chased at or snapped at because, you know, my dog is uh, resource guarding, right? So maybe what the more appropriate thing to do there is like put my dog on a 40 foot long line and find a field that doesn't have any other dogs in it and play fetch with them there versus the, the dog park right? So I'm going to find a scenario that works for them. Yeah. Th- thank you for bringing that up. I, I think that is so important. And it, it comes back to just us as humans. We like always, we, we have this mindset of like, well, my dog should be going to dog parks or my dog should be fine with doing this. Like that's what dogs do. But at the end of the day, I, I love what you said of we have to be the guardians to our dogs and we have to know and understand them. And I, I do, I do, you know, I, I can have sympathy that some people just, you know, if you have a new puppy, it can be overwhelming. You maybe don't know your dog very well yet. Or if you have a rescue, you know, it can take some time to figure out your dog, but it's so important to do things that are in line with our dog's capabilities essentially. Right. Like, and, and just being aware of that. So I, I love, love, love that advice. Um, so, so one point on that, we kind of have like two more thoughts here is, you know, at what point should I get a professional trainer involved? Because again, I think some people like it might be, it's something that happens not very often or only in a certain situation. Like when would you recommend getting a professional trainer involved if there is resource guarding happening? You know, I think if it, if I was to give my best advice here, it's at the it's at like first warning signs. Um, unfortunately, when I get called in, the behavior has been practiced a lot. There might have been a couple bites already. It's at the point where it's becoming a little unmanageable. And um, now I'm like the last stop. <laughs> in, you know what I mean? So if we call in the trainer, we call in the professional when we're like, ooh, this, this behavior is a little worrisome. I've, you know, I've seen this maybe two or three times now, and it's a little concerning instead of kind of sweeping it under the rug or, you know, watching those, those YouTube videos that might not be so helpful, um, you know, and trying to do it the DIY way, call in a professional who can really help you out. Um, even, you know, the most well meaning, all my clients are so well meaning, you know, they, they really, really do want the best for their pets. And I know that. Um, but sometimes, you know, they're not, I, I wouldn't, if, if it's beyond a clog, I'm not in there trying to pull out piping, right? I'm going to call in a plumber because it's just outside of my realm of expertise. And it's the same thing with your dog. I wouldn't mess around with aggression training. I just wouldn't do it. You really, really need to kind of call somebody in who has an educational background, some certifications under their belt and a good amount of experience working with that behavior. And that's gonna be your best road forward. If you start to kind of tinker around with it yourself, you could make things worse. And you know, to be frank, that's what I find a lot of times. And in the long run, it will likely, I mean, even if you're just looking at it from like a, not everything in life is about money, but if you're looking at it from a financial perspective, similar to your, you know, example with the plumbing, you know, if you let something continue to get worse and continue to get worse, and then you try to mess with something and next thing you know, you've got a water leak and your entire basement is flooded, right? And I think it's similar with our dogs where, you know, I think a lot of people, and again, I, I don't mean to like, I know everyone's financial situation is different. And, and for some people, it can be difficult to hire a trainer. But again, if, if even if it's one or two sessions, like, to get that knowledge and to get that expertise in your home to like really eliminate it before it gets worse. Because again, I don't want to go down this path too much, but my wife is a nurse and 
you know, she has people come in all the time with bites from dogs. And, you know, oftentimes that financial burden falls on you as the pet guardian, the pet parent. And so, yeah, it's important to get it early. I love, love that advice. So on that kind of note, and maybe kind of a final wrap up with resource guarding is what can I do as a pup parent to as much as possible of like help avoid resource guarding from starting? Yeah, you know, there are great exercises that you can do either with your new rescue dog or your puppy. Um, I'll start with the puppy stuff because you, you not always, because like I mentioned, it can be kind of a genetic behavior that we see really, really early, um, in which case you would want to, again, like hopefully hire a professional who can help you kind of um, remedy some of those things. Um, but you can do some prevention exercises with your puppy Things like hand feeding your puppy, um, you know, hand feeding them right out of their bowl so that they're really comfortable and used to hands around their bowls. Um, teaching your puppy that hands are a really great uh, holder for their bully sticks or, you know, their like really high value like trachea things that they're chewing on. Um, aren't human hands great because they hold them in place and you can get that really kind of deep gnawing chew going on. Human hands aren't really there just to like grab them and take them away. Um, also practicing things like trades. So, you know, you have that trachea piece and your puppy is chewing on it. You have another of the same or higher value chew and you're just trading back and forth. And so you're teaching your puppy that, um, you know, not only is dropping like, okay, but you're going to get the exact same thing or sometimes even a, an extra goodie back for relinquishing that item. Um, and same thing with their toys. You're going to want to make sure to do that handling desensitization. So grabbing paws, grabbing collars, touching ears, examining the mouth and teeth and holding them, restraining them, um, all within their comfort level. Of course, we don't want to make this like a torturous session or anything, but, you know, make sh making sure that you're feeding them and doing some of that counter conditioning throughout. Um, and, you know, there's actually no reason why you couldn't do some of those same exercises with like your new rescue dog. I would just um, caution to, you know, go a little slower with an adult dog because, you know, there might be some resistance if, if your dog is a little not used to those sorts of things. So just go slow with them as you're practicing those things, but it's pretty much the same, um, protocols for your, um, you know, your counter conditioning. Awesome. That Those are really, really good actionable tips that people can start working on. So thank you for sharing those. And, and one kind of point that I've been thinking about as we've been talking, again, just an extra note for people who do have more than one animal in their home. The management is so, so, so important. I have three dogs and at the end of the day, they love each other. They are friends, they play, they get along. But at the same time, if I'm going to give all three of them a bully stick, I know that Buddy, this older guy here in the middle, for those watching, I've got to put him in a different room than the labs just because he's getting older, his senses are a little bit not as good, and he he doesn't get boundaries as much. So it's like you just have to be, you know, train the dog in front of you, be aware of your dog's limitations, I guess. It's kind of a bad word, but, you know, just being aware of those things and, and managing as you can. So th thank you so much, Jocelyn. I I learned a lot. I I believe that pup parents listening to this are probably feeling, you know, good that they have at least somewhat of a grasp of of this resource guarding challenge that can pop up. And I just want to reiterate one more time again, if you're having troubles with this, or even if you think it's something that's starting to happen, like Jocelyn said, get a professional in your home sooner rather than later. And, you know, take care of it before it escalates into something worse. So thank you again, Jocelyn, for, for joining us on the podcast. I loved having you on for this episode. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. It's always fun to chat. Of course. And, and we will include um, all of Jocelyn's information. You can connect with her, um, you know, especially if you're in the LA area and you're needing help with, with something like this, you know, uh, we'll have her information in the show notes um, in the episode details. Um, and I, I say it every episode, but, we truly do appreciate all of you listening and watching. 
and we love your feedback. If you have, you know, a topic that's a challenge for you or something that, you know, you would really like us to do an episode about, um, let us know and we will, you know, put it into our schedule and, and try to cover it because we know that raising a puppy or a dog, an older dog, it's not always easy. Um, but, you know, there's so much that we can learn, especially from experts like Jocelyn. So um, for those of you, uh, again, we will catch you guys on the next episode.